The title of my speech today is The Entrepreneurial Independent Music Teacher. The subline of that is encouragement, strategy, and what comes next. And what I wanted to share is, hopefully, from my presentation, is that you're going to feel really encouraged about what you've been doing and how awesome you've been through this time we just went through and, and what's coming next. I also, uh, I'm going to be, what, I, what I'll be talking about, I hope that you feel inside like, oh, that's something I already do. And that's the goal, is that what we're talking about is like, oh, I'm already doing this, and maybe there's an area that I can lean into more, okay? So that's kind of the goal, and, the, and then we'll look at kind of the long-term outlook as well. So a, a little bit about me. I'm an independent music teacher. I teach here in Seattle. I'm, I'm part of this organization. You know, my grandfather was a lifelong music teacher as well, and he was a, a, a really great fixture in the Shenandoah Valley. He was a concert classical pianist. He was also the big band director at the local high school, kind of like out of Norman Rockwell painting for his entire career. And he was fabulously well-dressed, and he had this kind of heyday in the 40s and 50s. He had a big band. And I grew up seeing him as a child as this, like seeing a music teacher being just the center of a community. And he was so handsome, and he had, he was dashing, and he had great clothes. He drove one of those Jeeps with the wood sides, right back in the day. And you know, he loved to say, my Jeep could drive up a telephone pole. And he smoked a pipe. And when I walk down um, downtown Broadway now, I go to a local music store and I go home to visit, you know, people will stop me. The owner of the store will be like, oh my gosh, your grandfather taught me. And he smoked a pipe in his, in his lessons. And I remember the busts that he had in the studio. And so I grew up with this image of what being a music teacher looked like and how important it was. That's what leads me here today. I've also always been very entrepreneurial and very interested in business. Seven years ago, yes, I founded a technology company, but the journey of that has been really interesting. One is I've been able to put together a team of 15 people, raise venture capital. You know, I, I had this always thing, I'm like, I can play a box few on a guitar, I can do a tech company, like what's the big deal, right? You know, it is really hard, by the way. It, it's, 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 when someone's like, I'm gonna build an app. It is a, it's a challenging thing, but a couple of things have, one is I've learned a lot more about the broader spectrum of business. And the second thing is we quickly realized that when we started Fonz, you know, Fonz means wellspring or fountain in Latin, right? And that was where the name came from. If we were quickly realizing that there's a lot more than music teachers who do this type of work, such as academic tutors, uh, personal trainers, wellness professionals, life coaches, we've got a ton of dog trainers, right? That's a big thing that use this thing now. And so we were able to learn from that. In that experience, one of the things I've done is I'm a talker. I love to talk to people and I love to meet people is I've got many thousands of people that run these types of business that are either just like ours, or similar to ours, or different enough, but close enough that the operational structure is really similar. And I've got to learn a lot from them. That this is kind of where my, my, my topic came up, is I started to realize that there's, when you look at the top one to five percent of business owners, these are like independent music teachers, or tutors, or trainers, people that are like the real centers of their community, kind of like my grandfather was. They have a few things that they all do. Over time, when you meet 10 and 100, and you're like, oh my gosh, this is the thing that they're doing that's very similar. And what we're gonna talk about today is a marketing flywheel for independent music teachers. Now this, this relates and applies to anything. It's really, I've honed this in for what we do. And as marketing has shifted, and the broad spectrum of marketing has shifted, you all are all really good at it. Right? And that's the thing that I've learned, and as I talk to people that work in other verticals and other industries and other businesses, is what we do inherently, this heart center, centers of our community, that's what all companies want. That's why I want you to feel really encouraged by what we're going to talk about today. I'm gonna to try to avoid using like big marketing slang, like CPC, PPC, RO, you know, we're gonna to try to keep it to where it's much more high level, and hopefully when you leave, you feel encouraged, and you feel like there might be some things that you can, you can lean into. So we're going to start out today with uh, the idea of what a marketing flywheel is. And the, you guys know what a flywheel is? No. Okay. The concept of a flywheel, maybe you can think of like a rowing machine. Uh, a flywheel is a physics term where you've got basically a wheel going. It takes a lot to get going. And the first time you push it around, it takes a lot of force, a lot of energy. But as it gets momentum, it's much easier, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at like, wow, what are the things that keep our marketing going. And so, first off, what does marketing mean to an independent music teacher? Like, does any, like, what do you, when you think of marketing, which hopefully you do at some point, what does marketing mean to us? Referral. 
Okay, well sure, even at a more basic level. When we're marketing, what are we trying to do? Trying to We're doing what? Sell ourselves, our service, get students. We're trying to get students. That is marketing for music teachers. Marketing as a music teacher means any action you do that has people bring the, that has people come in your door. Now, when you look, we're not going to talk anything outside of this purvey of marketing because above marketing we have brand, below marketing we have sales, below sales we have operations, which is what I'm really passionate about. But today we're talking about marketing, which is that idea of how to get people coming in your door constantly and consistently. What are some ways that we can market? Just off the top, I'll go first. Facebook ads. What's another way that we can market our service to get new students? Website. Website. What else? Referrals. Referrals. Word of mouth. Word of mouth. Mm -hmm. Volunteering. Volunteering. Being in your community. This is marketing. Uh, at a higher level, you can say, yes, there's Google ads. There's people that do that incredibly well. There's people that do a million dollars a year of lessons through just Google ads with one thing that's called a channel. We're not going to talk about any of those today. Facebook ads, Google ads, building a YouTube channel, uh, writing a book, having a website, SEO optimization, having an email list. These are marketing channels. What we're going to do is we're going to start with a sustainable, authentic marketing strategy that uses none of the things we just talked about. The closest thing would be referrals or word of mouth. Because uh, many people have their ideas. Many people just have the phone ring. I, know I have the phone ring. I have three or five people, usually a week or a month at least, you know, where I haven't been, I've been full for 15 years. So before the pandemic, every year I did a thing called Camp Ram, where I would take my top 15 or 18 high school students and we'd go up into the mountains and I'd rent out this Ponderosa Lodge, and for a week we'd turn that, that lodge into a recording studio. And the kids would play music from all day long, every day. We'd cook meals together, we'd go on adventures, we'd play concerts. And it was amazing. I took this like co-ed group of high school kids up into the mountains every year, and it was always great. I mean, we, did, we had a tree fall on our van one time during a freak storm, and there was the fires and stuff. But aside from that, it went really well. <laughs> this, this moment, during the camp one time, is we're just coming up with ideas of what the kids can do. And one of the things I was like, at that time, you all probably know my kids, Huck and Edie. Huck was probably three, and Edie was probably eight, and they were both very involved in the happenings of the camp. And one of the assignments for each day was to say, okay, kids, nine o'clock tonight, I want a two or three part harmony, acapella piece, your choice. You have to, we're gonna time you to see how fast, how quickly you can put Huck and Edie to sleep. And at you know, 9 o'clock, we'd tuck the kids in the bed, and light candles, and there'd be 17 kids surrounding this bed, and quilted in, and then they'd, as I went down to, they'd start singing these songs, and they got down to like 45 seconds. And the kid, I mean, it was an amazing memory. I got more students from that moment than any ad campaign I've ever run, any, anything I've ever done. Kids like went home and told their parents about it, and something it triggered in their parents where they couldn't stop talking about that. It wasn't even, there was many events like that within the camp. There was many moments that were really beautiful. But that thing of all these kids doing an acapella piece, singing for my kids and putting them to sleep and timing. I mean, my phone was ringing forever. It, I mean, for so long, that story still gets told. And that was like the first year I did it. That was like 10 years ago. And I think that is marketing. Right? And so the very first rule of every awesome provider is you see them doing great work. And to me, that's my great work, is I can come up with things that get kids really engaged that their parents want to talk about. Right? And that's been my thing since day one, is I have a really fun time teaching music. I love teaching music. It is my brand to take kids through the formative years, to give them transformative experiences. That's what great work is. Right? And there are many ways that you can have a transformative experience. You know, and there's, this, this becomes what our brand is. So the first rule of, of marketing as a strategy, right, as a way to have a successful business, is to do great work. So hopefully, I bet everyone here is thinking to themselves, oh yeah, I have this moment. I have many of these moments where, yeah, people call me or I showed up for this thing, and then that's where I get more students from. Again, this applies to anything, but it's the core. 
And it, it's frankly, you know, there are many people that we run across that aren't inspired by their work, right? That have lost the gratitude for how awesome it is to do what we do. And that's something they need to lean into or they can't be successful. And so from that great work, from that being inspired, from doing things that people want to talk about, the next piece is you build a community. And this is, this is the deal, is you know, you've got this great work and a community will naturally come from it, right? And at first when you're in a new town, you're not gonna have a community yet. yet. And so if you focus on that great work and you focus on finding people that will talk about you and investing everything you can into your students, to their success, to showing up to their recitals, you know, go and fix the PA at your student's recital and stand up when it doesn't work and turn, show them how to turn the mic on. And you'll get phone calls from that. For me, my entire marketing budget as a music teacher for as long as I've taught was in one thing. And I don't know if y'all can see this. Here's a picture of my, my kids. And my recitals are called the Guitar Cube. And when the first year I did a recital, you know, one kid showed up who's now a, a, a bassist for the Seattle Symphony. Two other kids showed up. Three kids showed up at the first recital I ever did. It was so depressing. And the second <laughs> recital I did, I bought all these drinks and I thought it was going to be great. No one showed up. Second year, I was like, screw it. I'm just going to do what my mom would do. I'm going to have a barbecue. Everybody's invited. Just show up. It's going to be outside. We'll see what happens. 200 people show up. And uh, I was like, oh my gosh, that's like 100 pounds of pulled pork I made. And it's all gone. And that became the guitar cube. The signs were made, t-shirts were made, kids were allowed to bring their friends. That was it. You know, that was my marketing budget for the year. And I, you know, I've always had a waiting list. It's all based out of that community that was built for me. People would come to the guitar barbecue. People would share videos from the guitar barbecue. That one moment, in the weeks that would follow, in the months that would follow, all the way around the year until the next time I did it again, I would get phone calls. I was doing what I felt to be very great, unique, authentic, work to my personality, right? And that's what hopefully you're thinking about yourself. What's my personality? You know, can my kids win competitions consistently? Can I take them to that great level? Can I just bring them great joy in their heart when they're playing? What is my thing that I lean into that I do well? How can I build a community around it? And I love this because right now, everybody in our space is trying to sell a course or they're trying to market themselves internationally on the internet, right? They're in a moment of thinking, oh my gosh, I can scale. I can sell a thousand courses, and there are people that are doing this, right? There are people that are making a lot of money selling piano courses. The people like ourselves, this is our time to lean into our communities because parents are desperate for their kids to have, and themselves to have real life experiences, to be with trusted mentors, to be with people that they think are awesome. So our moment is amazing, right? And it's going to be for a long time. The centers of our communities, and that's what the whole world desperately needs. So this marketing flywheel is kind of taking off. We find our great work, we're leaning into it, and from that great work, we get a community built around it. People talking about us, people showing up to our stuff, people that want to support us, which this takes us to the third, and I think the most important piece of a marketing strategy for an independent music teacher. The third piece of this marketing flywheel of this business strategy is to let your community support you. That is, well, I, I think that's the most important piece, is you've done this great work that you believe in. You've built a community around it. Your community of people is most likely professionals. What we do is culture. We sell culture, we sell happiness, we sell excellence, right? These are the things that we do. The people that are hiring us, they're doctors, they're lawyers, they work in technology, they have a different relationship to money than most of us grew up having. And if we're lucky enough to know these people and understand, they appreciate a professional relationship. And so another way of work, what I'm trying to say is that out of the uh, well over a thousand music teachers that I've sat down with and been able to say, you can charge a lot more than what you're charging. I don't even know, even know what that is. I just know that you can charge more. That is a marketing strategy because if I take two teachers and put them side by side with the same website, the exact same skill set, same clothes, same attitude, everything exactly the same, and one of them charges twice what the other one does, categorically, 100% of the time, the person who charges more will get more students. And my experience for this was very personal in that right before Edie was born, I had a fabulous studio downtown. I've been teaching for 10 or so years. Allison was running my studio, we were very happy. And I was ready to go 
get an MBA or go to law school, as I always planned to do. I was going to either get my master's in classical performance, get, you know, do the doctoral thing. I didn't want to go into academia. I was like, oh, it's time. I'm going to get an MBA or go to law school and see what happens. I was ready for that next progression because I was getting ready to start a family. I had a student at the time. His name was Bryce. And he was a legend in Seattle. He knew everybody that started every company basically in Seattle. He was an architect. And I, I had started teaching him right around his 60th birthday. Oh my gosh, we had so many wonderful adventures together. And I was like, you know, Bryce, I'm kind of out. I'm, I'm, I'm off to other things. And he's like, what are you talking about? And then I was like, dude, I'm starting a family. Like, it's time to, like, I got to do this. You know, and you know, Allison's acting career is doing well, and one of us needs to probably have, like, a straight day job. And he's like, dude, just double your rates. And I was like, this, and this is 2005. This is before anybody was doing this. And I was like, I'm not doing it. And he's like, dude, look at your student roster. Like, these people are, these are, like, look at these people. No one's going to care. In fact, everybody's going to want to support you. And, I'll, and he's like, just try. And so I did. And I very reluctantly doubled my rates in 2005. This is before anybody was doing it. And because I know that's a thing now where people are trying to elevate this, this profession that we have. And so I did it and waited for the response. And everyone said, oh, cool. And I was like, oh my gosh, are you kidding? And, then, and it was a big deal then. And suddenly, at this time, I was making a great living five weeks later. And I was like, I guess I won't leave, because this is the money that I was hoping to make with an MBA. And then something else happened. My phone started ringing off the hook. And it had, and I was early in that. I was charging a lot more than the people that I studied with, people that were really well known. I was referring students back to them because I was charging them. Because the majority of people that we are talking to in our community, they have no way to judge us. They don't know. Right? They, they don't know what, they don't, they, they're going to learn culture. They're trusting you to teach their children themselves culture. You know, and if you give them two options, they're going to, they're going to generally often use this concept called perceived value. And that's how the relationship will begin. This is the part of the flywheel that is, is critical for marketing. And so you're not doing it because you're trying to be greedy. You're not doing it because you're trying to, because it's the right thing to do because we're professionals. We do just as impactful work as our lawyer or doctor buddies. We're doing it because it, al it allows people to feel good about supporting us. They know it's a vibe where you're like, oh my gosh, I'm doing great work. And I'm building all these people around me that like, they show up for me and they support me and they love me. And when I ask them to support me, they're wanting to do it because they want me to keep doing this work. This is the flywheel. And once the flywheel is running, that's marketing. You are trying to be authentic because people, there's enough noise that people can see when you're not being real. People can sense authenticity. People can sense care and they can sense, they can sense compassion and they want to support it. Uh, I've seen people have tremendous success with it. I have not seen people, and I, I don't want to go too deep into it, but I know people that have been trying desperately to see what that ceiling might be for what they could charge and still keep getting more students. And I see people not being able to find it because it just, it just, it, it all informs itself. I'm feeling good in my heart about the work I do. I'm making a living. I was able to buy a house. I did better work, right? Because I was healthy. I had health insurance, you know, whatever. All these things allow us to go deeper into being ourselves. And the people that are doing it are thriving. And the people that are doing it are going to thrive for at least the next decade. So many people are putting their energy into scaling into the digital realm, and it looks enticing. People want community, people want real life, and we are like the people to give that. We're music teachers, we're the, we're the center of it all, and so we make magic happen. That's the marketing flywheel. Uh, I want to talk about the strategy of it. You might feel really strong in a certain way, but you might feel like, you know what? The truth is I, I have felt really bogged down my work, I haven't practiced as much, I haven't created as much, I haven't been able to give as much to my students, I'm just trying to survive. You know, I forgot, I didn't know if I was gonna be able to talk to you all today. I was like, wow, if I have a panic attack, I know you all well enough, and I'm just gonna bridge it all for you to get five minutes. <laughs> and uh, cause I, who knows, right? So it's, it's a tough time. Finding one of those areas, you can play with it. You can play with your, asking your community to support you. Play with your perceived value. You can, you can adjust those numbers, just for new people, what you advertise, and see what happens. 
I know that categorically every single person that I've talked to in the last seven years that I've talked to been making a significant increase in what they ask their community to support them in. 100% of them. Never, ever, ever have they come back and not said, wow, I can't believe how that worked for marketing. In the last two years, I still, even though I can't take a lot of students right now, because I can only teach like 10 or 12 students, I still meet with them to see if it's a great fit and then to help distribute them to other teachers. When I do, in the last, well, I guess it's in the last five years, I've had one person balk at my prices, who was the CFO of a national health insurance company. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know what? I was like, of course. I was like, no, we're not working together. I'm not even referring you to my friends. So, like, are you kidding me? Like, no, thank you. I want to address something that I think is really important, which is equity. And this is the pushback that whenever I, I talk on this topic, they're like, oh, what about the equity? You know, what about that? You just priced yourself. No, that is the whole reason to do this. If we are doing great work, and if we are being supported by an ever-growing community, you can, money never becomes a thing that keeps you from teaching a great student. Because you're like, I'm taken care of. I'm good. So yeah, I want to work with you and you want to work with me, we can work something out. And you both feel good about it. So really, this is actually a path to equity. Like when you put your oxygen mask on, it increases your studio size. It makes you happier. It allows you to do greater work. It allows you to distribute your services more equity. So that is what I have to share today. And that's your marketing, which my life work has become elevating this industry. And not just ours, but the people that are purveyors of knowledge, of culture. Our work is very critical to the fabric of the world moving forward. And I really believe that. The more that I do this, having tried to leave this field and then realizing how much I love it, being pulled away from teaching as much as I was enabled, because I wanted, I needed the universe to give me something different. I was ready to use my mind in a different way and I needed this moment to start a technology company. And that, that came, I, it came up as an opportunity and I really jumped at it, I'm glad I did. And from day, you know, day 300 after the first year of doing this, I was like, oh my gosh, I cannot wait until I can go back to teaching full time. <laughs> right? Because that's like, this work is so impactful and it's so beautiful and it's so meaningful. A lot of my friends and professional researchers are just working to retire. And I've always thought that's so lame. Why do your life's work to be something just to get it over with so you go to the beach somewhere? Uh, if you're interested in this stuff and you like the idea that I host my community, is I come up, it's called Fawn's Family, right? You don't have to use Fawn's or anything to do it, but it's just, it's a Facebook group of really awesome business owners from all over. And anybody's welcome to join in, provided that you're cool and friendly. <laughs> um, but I, I encourage you to check it out, because it's, 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 I think it's, I'm really proud of it. I think it's a great example of how we've been able to lean into a community to help guide us to a product, which is different than what we're doing as a music teacher, but to get that feedback and to, and to grow it, so. Thanks for having me, everybody. It's been really, really fun.